Hi, my, my name is Adam Hems and I'm here with Keith Sizer in Galveston Seawolf Park and today we're going to get a, t a private tour from Keith uh, of this su submarine, the USS Cavella. Uh, Keith, tell us a little bit about yourself and what we're going to uh, hear about the submarine today. Okay, hi, I'm a, I'm a submarine veteran from 1972 to 1993. Well, my first submarine I was on is very similar to this, so this is kind of old home week for me. Uh, we're going to be going aboard the ship, looking at a little bit of how it operates, the uh, primitive lifestyle that those who sailed on it had to go through and endure, uh, maybe have a little fun uh, doing some exercises and things like that, and uh, we'll just see how well things go. All right, looking forward to it. Thanks, Keith. You're welcome. Let's go. Well, first the sub, if you look up clear in the front, you'll see some wings sticking out. Those wings are used to lift the front end up and down when you're in the water. That's how you go shallower or go deep. Uh, works much like a plane, except it's much slower speed. There's another set in the back that we can squat the back end down the water, lift it up. Between the two, you dive and, and surface. Uh, what you see here is the hull. That's, that, I guess you would say, would be the outer hull. There's actually a... a inch and a half or inch whatever thick hull inside this is just a skin and between the skin and the hull that's the ballast tanks so it doesn't have to hold much pressure ballast tanks are either all the way full or all the way empty uh, our new addition here <laughs> subrock this is a nuclear uh, depth charge so we take this, we launch it 10,000 yards away, it plunks in the water, goes down to maybe three, 400 feet, and a nuclear device goes off. Wow. Launch and so up. the nuke head is up, is up here in the front. You don't think it's still in there, do you? Well, I, I don't know whether they remember to take it out or not. But anyway, th this is the head. I think this is a W55 nuclear head. Don't hit it with a hammer. <laughs> and uh, that's all the rest of it. This is just basically a rocket that you would see like in Na NASA when they launch a rocket. It's just enough to take it 10,000 yards, 10 miles, something like that. Out of the top of a submarine, like not this no, one? No, we would shoot it right out of the tor torpedo tube and it comes up. Uh, There's a sensor that says, hey, the front of my nose is out of the water. And it blasts up and takes off like a rocket and just runs down at huh. maybe five, 600 miles an hour. And then plunks in the water. Huh, wow. So th this is a pretty cool weapon. I've slept by these many a time. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Last time I saw one of these is at the Museum Piece in Charleston. I always wondered whether they get could get one here. And this is but, rockets at the back? Okay, I see. Yes, yes. Uh, Th no, actually not. This is where you hook the cables onto so our launching computers can tell it what to do. So this is going to go take off, and it's going to blow the end off. And then uh, you've got a regular a rocket, jet, rocket beneath propulsion this shell. coming out the back. Oh, wow. What years did they use it? Uh, I had them in probably 70, in the 70s, 80s, and then these came off. So, and, and there's a lot of controls involved with, with nuclear weapons. What is this one? This is, uh, doesn't say what it is. Uh, I, this is probably a 14, Mark 14 or Mark 16, Mark 14 probably. Old school torpedo. And there's, there should be one, there, there's one of these down below. Okay. This is what the sub would have shot out the front and Yes, back. this is, this is a World War II type device. This is going to be a Cold War type device. Okay. okay. Uh, the platform you see on here is just a, a shell. It was really there. But underneath, there's all sorts of piping for the engines, uh, exhaust pipes, things like that. I've got a picture I can show. I've got a picture I can show you what used to be there before it got taken out. So let's head on up. After you, sir. Beautiful Texas day for it. Oh, yes. If the weather will just stay nice and cool like this for a few weeks, the end of the month, uh, 
Blue Lagoon trip should be nice. Yeah. Now, if you look through these cracks, it looks like there's a lot of room, but you can actually see the actual pressure hole. Uh, occasionally, if you look, you'll find some boxes with some grates and whatever on. Those are vents. Uh, I'll be able to show you a better vent up front. This is the after engine room area. So when we get there, I'll point to that and you'll know where you're at in the ship. No, oh, no. This is how it was. This is how it was. It was made of teak. Oh, wow. Teak is a lubricated wood, so it doesn't rot. Huh, so it went down with this wood on it? I... Yes, yes. Oh, wow. Did it make it more buoyant? <laughs> well, it, it probably did a little bit, but it was all figured into it. Okay. Now, they replaced this back, oh boy, 15 years ago. And at that time, if they was to do this, I think it was said it would be a million and a half dollars just for this wood. Mm. Teak is very expensive. One inch by one inch by a foot is about $10. <laughs> that was back then. We've actually got the teak wood deck below in the ship. Or what's left of what hasn't rotted away. So this is original to the ship? What no, no, this, was, this is a replacement of oh, what was original, but it, it gives the uh, uh, okay. uh, aesthetic okay. view of it. That's the way it would have been. There's a number of things up here you'll see, like plates. And every space has a couple holes in it. This is a high, so just, so this down here, there's a valve on the, well, you can actually see the valve. And then there's a rod that comes up, but that rod comes up in here. You can open that valve and hook up a hose to it. It goes through the hull and stops about that far through the hull. That makes it high. Over here, that's low, and that pipe goes all the way down into the bilge, high and low. I can blow air in here, pressurize it, that pushes the water out, and the water comes out, so you can dewater the ship and salvage a sunken ship. That's why this is a salvage valve. Huh. Now, if anybody's gonna sit and hook those hoses up, who would hook the hoses up? Divers. Divers. Well, let's say this is down 200 or 300 feet. How does he know the engine space from the cook space, from the birthing space and whatever? <laughs> Every one of these has a different number of screws on them. Huh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Salvage valve number nine is engine room, is the after engine room high valve. 10 is gonna be after engine room low valve and it counts all the way back. Wow. You could just put a number on top. <laughs> well, you got to be able to read that, and you're probably going to have coastal thump, 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 thump. It's kind of like Braille. Yeah, because yeah, it might be dark, muddy. That, can't yeah, see a that's thing. right. That's right. It's not going to be in you know, a nice, clean coral reef, necessarily. And we'll, we'll see how we escape from the inside, the escape things that let us get out of the ship. And uh, now, here's a. this is a high because the ship, if, it, if I have flooding aft, the butt goes down. That means the forward part of the compartment is high. This is the front of the compartment. Here's the low for the forward engine room, the high for the after engine room. This is the bulkhead wall that goes between the two engine rooms. So you can tell pretty much where you're at. From the outside. Mm -hmm. Wow. And this has all been stripped down, torched out, removed. Oh, here's one of these cages. I told you about the wire cage. And this is a main vent. So when that vent opens up, it lets the air out of the ballast tanks. Of course, we get, you could say we get heavier. Actually, we get smaller. It shrinks us. With air in the ballast tank, we're this big. When you put water in, we're now this big. Submerged, we're the size of the pressure hull. On the surface were the size of the outside diameter of the uh, ballast tanks. The weight doesn't change, but our size changes, so we float. That's what buoyancy is all about. Weight versus displacement. Here's uh, one of the air, the air inlets to the engine room. This is the Ford engine room. We'll see it when we get there. 
but the piping brings the air in and drops it in the engine room so the engine can use that air to run. And you can see how big that hole is. It's pretty large. Oh, that is a huge hole. Sealed off with some glass or something? Yeah, we just put some plastic over. Rain doesn't blow in it. Okay. And so that, that should give you an idea how much air these engines consume. What is that, two feet diameter, something like probably, that? It's probably somewhere up in there. Yeah, wow. There's a vent. No, no, well, what's this one? Uh, this is a valve, so that might be an exhaust valve or something. Another vent. And it looks like uh, another vent. No, it's, it's not redundancy. I've got seven ballast tanks from front to back. So uh, number one has its own vent. Everything else until you get to number seven, half of it's on one side, half of it's on the other. So I have a ballast tank here and ballast on the other. They call them saddle tanks, just like saddle bags on a horse. So they run a pipe up from each one and run it into a common valve. And that's that vent that opens up and the air comes out both sides and escapes. That way you go down straight and you don't fall over the side. Fascinating. This is the sail. Submerged, it is flooded. It's there for hydrodynamics. And when it comes to nuclear ships, they only have one propeller. So when the propeller turns this way, it doesn't really want to move in the water and tries to make the submarine roll this way. So this is sitting not straight, it's a little bit at an angle. Oh wow. So as you go through the water, it's got that force to keep it upright on a nuke. On a diesel boat, since we have two propellers, one propeller goes one direction, the other one goes the other direction, and it counters the torque out. And these things will only run maybe three miles an hour. Otherwise, the battery is shot in a couple hours, and you'll spend a day and a half charging. So what's the difference between a nuke and a, the other one? Diesel you mean besides power. spelling? <laughs> OK. Well, the nuclear power, the, this uses diesel uh, engines to run a generator. The, uh, the United States is the only country in the world that makes an electric submarine. Electric refers to the propulsion. It's not a steam-driven propeller. It's the electric motor-driven propeller. So we've got batteries, just like in your kids' little cars, but instead of a little joystick, it's more complicated to run. But it's an electric motor that turns the propeller. That makes an electric boat. General Dynamics, the electric boat division in Connecticut makes submarines, and they just kept the name. They make nukes now. Now, with a nuke, it's a steam-driven propeller, and the nuclear plant heats water up to make steam. So that uses like a oil burner to boil water. We use nuclear power on here because you just throw the lid on the pressure cooker and you just let it go for 30, 40 years. And then you re refuel it. So what's inside this sail, Keith? This is just a skin. All the periscopes are in here. Okay. All your communication antennas are here. Without this, if you went through the water five or six knots, the water pressure would just bend it over like your uh. car antenna does in the car wash when you left it up. So to avoid that, we have this shield on it. Okay. So it serves as something to stabilize. It houses the, the mass. It makes it hydrodynamic to reduce drag. And when water flows past things, it makes noise. So we don't have 15 things in there going ch -ch 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 -ch, where you could be heard. It's just one flow of water going across. But isn't that unfair to the enemy? Well, yeah, but they're doing the same thing too. And, but they can, oh, okay. they can whine all they oh, want. All fair and love and war. That's right. A little later. Is there a difference? <laughs> Is there a difference? No. Okay, good. <laughs> it just depends the weapons you're using. <laughs> but you can see through the window here that the, the officers driving this thing, oh my gosh, look at the antenna. Greg, what? antenna's pointing that way, behind your head. The one in there, it's pointing that way. It's not even pointing at the ship. Yeah, maybe sure that's why we... Have we connectivity right now. Could be. Oh, yeah, guaranteed we don't. Uh, 
This is called the navigator's windows. Now, that, this has windows because that has windows. And they just mimicked whatever they did. There's a table in here so they could put charts on and navigate there. But when it splashes, it gets the charts wet. So they don't use it, but they just put it on there because they didn't know any better. Uh, and there's a way to get from here to crawl down below the stuff. Inside of this also, you see the gray tank in front? That is the conning tower. That's where the fire control uh, and weapon launching and that type of stuff happens. Where I'm looking? Where he, where he's standing? That? Clear up there by the water, that gray tank. Oh, with 639 right on it? 15 feet, no, 639, look to the right. Oh, that guy. Okay. That yeah, gray tank that. is in here. That's okay. the conning tower that we got the keys okay. that people don't get to go into. Okay, and so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, for those of you who have no idea about periscopes, Look up at the top, and we have two periscopes. One's kind of pointy and pencil neck kind, and the other one's more of a kind of a big block of junk on top. Well, they have two different purposes. The first one is referred to as a navigation scope. With that scope, I could shoot stars, just as if I had a sextant to determine my location in the ocean. There's a hole right in the middle. That's a radar antenna. So I can point at something and use the radar and get the range on it. Uh, the window down below is going to be, uh, I forget what all is going to be in there. I don't know this exact periscope. Uh, clear at the top is the view window out that you look out where the mirrors tip and, and whatever. And there's a little stubby antenna up on that. And that's a wide band antenna. So you stick the antenna up, they go, uh oh, there's a radar out there and pull it down before you raise the, 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 the super good one. So if there's something close that can see you, that antenna will pick it up. But when it goes through the water, it tends to splash. So now we have the, the scope behind it, who's really thin. It doesn't splash very much. So if we're getting up close to a ship, we use the attack periscope, which is what it's referred to, so it doesn't leave a splash that someone with binoculars can see. And we all know they're writing letters to their girlfriend. They ain't got time to look for something. But when something big and black jumps up, they kind of tend to notice that. So, what? Somebody, oh, Tony is a guy who works here. And he put that plate on there and put his name on it. A little welder graffiti. <laughs> But, but he's, not a, he's not a big, what do you call it, tagger, so he just kind of left it subtle in front where everybody can see. <laughs> I would almost guess that this is where the whistle is. The whistle? Uh-huh. Wonk, wonk. And that's probably where that's at. So they just covered that up instead of having to redo the hull. OK. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, that is, is, anybody have any questions about other stuff that's up here? Okay, let's head down below. We'll have air conditioning down here. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in the forward torpedo room because the after torpedo room's pretty well like it, like it. So we can cut, and the after torpedo room gets warm. So we can sit in the cool here and do this. You know, when you come down, dear, take a look through that crack. That, and that, to the right, that is a main vent. That's the one for ballast tank number one, and, th and those is what spread out from front to the back of the ship to vent the remaining six tanks. And it is a ladder, so you're going down the proper way. No sailor's ever done things like they were supposed to. Going up and down this stairs six or seven times. Oh, <laughs> if you've got bad knees or joints, you'll 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 know it. Go ahead and pull up a chair. Have a seat, Siri. Have a seat on a on a torpedo. Oh, a nice and cold seat too. Yeah, we All do right, that for girls that come in. <laughs> Keeps them. Ah, that is nice. The bunks have been taken out of here. I I don't know exactly what they're doing. I think they're waiting for authentic mattresses or something. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, the diesel boats had six torpedo tubes forward, and they would have four aft. 
Maybe by the time we get aft, you can figure out why they only have four. Later in this ship's life, they took two torpedo tubes out of here, and it was the top two torpedo tubes. They did that because at the time, this had no, no sonar, no ability to listen. So they said, the Germans and the, those guys, they seem to be shooting our stuff down. So if we want to get rid of them before they shoot a, a, a destroyer down, we need to be able to hear them. So that the front is normally pointed, but it has that bulbous front end. Those are hydrophones up there. And they couldn't be there if we had this 30-foot tube sticking through. So after talking to the Pentagon, uh, and the department of Isaac and Newton, who said you can't have two things in the same place at once. They took the tubes out and put the sonar listening hydrophones in. So now we only have four tubes here. You know who the department of Isaac and Newton is? <laughs> <laughs> so where's the four tubes? One, two. You're 50% there, you're, you're, you're holding true. There's two more just like them. Right underneath them? At the end. Underneath the floor. That's right. So you used to have one, two, three, four, five, and six. The top two have been taken out. Oh, there were six and then yes, four. Yes, they took right. the top two out to make room for, for underwater listening. So that should generate the question, what, about the, hi, sweetie, about the tubes under the floor. That's a good question. More importantly, how do you load the torpedoes? How you load the torpedoes? You take this floor out, and there's some little railroad tracks that go across here. You'll see them when we get to the after torpedo room, and we put them over here in the middle. And there's places on here and put chain falls on. We lift it up and we drop it down to the bottom. There's little railroad tracks here. We push them to whatever side we need to, and we find a torpedo that's a little skinny little guy, kind of like you. Because one has to sit out here with the torpedo there, another one has to be here, and they take ropes and pulleys, and they pull this and make it roll forward into the tube. It's not a fun thing to do if you have any rolling around going on. And you can't spend much time underwater because you don't, we do not refurbish the air. So what air you went down with is what you got. So when you see the World War II movie, it says, oh man, we've been down a day and a half. It's hot and people aren't thinking it's because the CO2 is getting high and the oxygen level is going down low. The nukes have the advantage of having a, a power plant that can make all the electricity you want. We manufacture oxygen there. And we have equipment to remove CO2. This didn't. The job of this thing is to push those things around. So you can only go down for one day with these? By that time, your oxygen is so low, you got to come up and get fresh air in. Mm -hmm. So if, you have, if you're stuck down, okay, everybody possible, go to bed. Cut the oxygen consumption and leave it for the maybe the remaining six or eight, ten people to do the thing. What would be the max that they would have been able to stay down? I don't know. It all depends how active they are. If you go up, you know you're dead. If you stay down, well, then well, you might just pet you. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, how long would the whole process of getting the CO2 out and getting the oxygen intake? On this one, mm -hmm. maybe 20, 30 minutes. Just blow it through vents. We start the diesel engine up. We suck in all that air. The air pours into the rooms. And then the diesel sucks up all the, the air, as much air as it can to run. The oxygen isn't that low. Do you know how much oxygen's in our air? Um, like 70. Oh. Well, no, 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 not, not nitrogen, oxygen. Oh, oxygen, 23? Okay, uh, let, so we'll just say it's 23. And you, you suck that in, and you go, and you exhale maybe 2% less. So you still got like 20% you're exhaling. And next time you breathe it, it goes, if everybody does that, you know, uh, at, at noon it's 21%, at 1 o'clock it's 20, at 3 o'clock it's 19%. Cigarettes won't burn, that you gotta keep sucking on it. If you set them down, the cigarettes just burn out because there's not enough oxygen. 
you get down to about 16 and you'll start to pass out. 18, you're droggy and you start falling asleep because your mind just doesn't have enough oxygen to work on. Uh, The CO2 builds up, makes you breathe faster. That's what makes you breathe, not low oxygen, high CO2. <laughs> so we, we have some things on board for emergency to, to use to clean some of that up with, and I'll tell you about that later when we get back to mom's area near where they cook the food. And <laughs> so with the, the regeneration of the air, do you have to go fully topside, or do they just stick a tube up to kind of... Hey, you know, a tube would be a good idea. If we had a tube on here, we could suck air in. Oh, wait, we do. It's called a snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> so we poke that snorkel up, and we suck fresh air in, let the diesel suck the bad air out, and throw it out the exhaust pipe, and that's how we bring the air in. And you saw how big of a hole there was going into that engine room. That's how fast that air will come in. They do that whenever they don't want to be detected as easily. Well, if you're, whenever you snorkel and charge, 99% of the time, this is running on the surface. It's got fresh air going through anyway. Right. right. So why spend money and put airy fixing stuff that hasn't been invented yet for something you're going to use 1% of the time? If you do your job right, you go down, you wait for them to go by, shoot them, then you come back up and take the picture. But some of them... You can see in the movie, says, oh, there's there, and they try running over them. So uh, that's what happens. Uh, yeah, this is not a fun th evolution to do this. So let's look at some of these torpedoes. Uh, you're sitting on top of a nuclear warhead. Okay, good to know. Good that, to know. This, that is a Mark 45 torpedo. Uh, it had a range of maybe, let's say, uh, 10,000 yards, somewhere around there. Uh, we shoot it out, and we have a little... Thin wire on it. Nuclear, nuclear weapons require we maintain positive control of all nuclear devices. You just don't throw it out the car window and let some bum pick it up in the ditch. You've got to make sure that if you don't get it, you've got to destroy it so no one else can use it. That little wire is to push the button, <laughs> detonate it. We send commands, turn right, turn left, go shallow, go deep. We can control that up to the point of detonation. How thick is this wire? Can you describe this wire? Bell wire, number 22, 24 gauge. Okay. There'll be a spool on the back, uh, well, the diameter of that may be that deep, and it might have 20,000 yards of wire on it. That's a lot of wire wrapped around, so and it that, doesn't take and that much. And shoots out the tube? How and it, it drags that wire right out with it. Remember on the, on the sub rock, you had those electrical connectors on the back? Right. That connected to the tube, but inside of that, if it was a torpedo, would be a spool of wire. The Mark 48s have 18,000 yards inside the torpedo and a spool to add another 20,000 yards, so you could steer that thing around for 38,000 yards. Hmm. 19 miles away, and you say, turn right, turn left. How did it stay, how did the wire stay attached to the submarine, having it pushed out of the tube, right? Right here is a connector. Oh. So there's a cable that on the inside of the door that goes from there and like plugs on the back of the torpedo. Literally this one? Yes, this oh. goes to fire control on the inside of the door. That connects to the torpedo. Oh. Oh, right. And there'll be a okay. wire that's on there. Okay. And we have a big thick sheath on it because when it goes out the tube, it flops back and forth. So that's a protective sheath until it, and it may hang out five feet out the back of the ship. After that, it's just a stream of wire that goes out. Wow. And then we come in, we flip a little lever. Uh, let's see if I can find it on here. Eh, I don't see it. But you flip, no, you flip a lever and it cuts it just like a pair of pliers. The wire pulls out and it's all done with. Then you can close the outer door. You can't close the door until that cable is out. Right, so right. you can see possible vulnerabilities, especially if you got a depth charge. Right. Now that's the only door holding the ocean out instead of two. Huh. Wow. So anyway, this is a nuclear torpedo. This does not belong up here. On this particular submarine? No, it would belong on this submarine, oh, but right. not in the front of the ship. Oh. Because it has a kill range of 15,000 yards. But if it blows up at 10,000 yards, You're on the kill range. You, are, you are inside the kill range. 
This belongs in the back of the ship where you poop it, and at the same time, you're getting out of dodge. If you turn the ship around, you'd end up cutting the wire, and you lose control of a nuclear weapon, and then you've got... Problems. Yeah, problems. You have to explain what happened. <laughs> and that's not good to explain such things. Mm -hmm. So this actually is always carried in the after torpedo room. <laughs> so uh, at 10,000 yards, this will run about 30, 30 knots, 30 times 2 is 60,000 yards, something, eh, it doesn't run, 6,000 yard. boy, I'm, I'm forgetting. 16? Anyway, you've got 10 minutes about before it goes boom. So how far can you go at 2 or 3 miles an hour in 10 minutes? Far enough. Half, 500 yards? So if you shoot it, it goes off at 10,000, you start at 10,000, and now you're 10,500 when it goes boom. You're still going to rack a little bit. Yeah, oh yeah. So that's where you try to put on as much speed as you can, maybe get 10 or 11 knots out of it, try to get up shallow where the shock wave comes so it doesn't crush you. In most cases, you shoot this and it's going to take the sub out, the shooter out. Right. And the other guy too. Huh. So uh, Is it intended to detonate underwater or on the surface? Underwater. Mm -hmm. So I can shoot at something 100 foot underwater. This is a, a submarine against submarine. Ah, okay. That would be the, so if it goes off anywhere near, the shock wave should disable the ship or crush the hull and then it sinks. Wow. Um, the megatonnage of the warhead? Oh my gosh. I don't remember. Fair enough. But you know, they take, they can really squeeze a lot of bang in a small box now. Big enough. And uh, our weapons now, they use a nuclear explosion to trigger another nuclear explosion to trigger the final nuclear explosion. So uh, one unit can really do a whole lot of damage. So there's, there's a lot of uh, safeguards involved with these. They, say, they will say this has a one-point system, which means one out of a million situations can it go off unintentionally. This thing needs a battery in it. So does that sub rock to make it work. The battery is locked up in a safe. So it, by theory, can't do anything. It has to sense acceleration. It has to sense a whole bunch of things before the weapon can arm. So in one of the million cases, I guess someone could drop a wrench in and trigger something, maybe if there was a static charge or something. So it's a one in a million chance that these can ever go off. And there's not much radiation coming off. I've slept by them for a lot of times. You know, you know that's what the that's what the guy at my wedding says. This explains Keith a whole lot. So uh, the radiation and whatever. So anyway, that's what we have here for torpedo tubes. Now these tubes is pretty well uh, yes. No, they, they took the gold part out and they took the bomb out and then this is just a, a, a replacement fake shell so that everything looks the same. If they was to ship this somewhere, it would have that when it gets to the torpedo shop, they put the nuclear bomb in and put it on a ship. But we don't use that anymore since maybe 76 or 78, something like that, because Mark 48's really neat weapon has uh, taken over its use, and we really don't need a nuclear device underwater because we don't have, we, we no longer have to say, I'll just throw it in this chunk of the ocean and it'll do it. When I can shoot a tin can at, four, at 20 to 40 miles mm -hmm. with a 48, just hit it and clink, clink, shoot on that bearing and it'll find the tin can and shoot it. Do you remember when these nukes ended service? When I think it's like 76, 78, okay. or somewhere in there, and they were, Removed. This is kind. Of, this was the 45. The 48 was the same kind of a shell and design, but the internals were all different. Okay, this weapon here is a Mark 14. This one runs on moonshine. So right out of the what do you call it? The Appalachians. Out of some still, they throw their their squeezins in here, and that's what it runs on. There's a squeezins tank there. It's marked torpedo fuel. And inside, that was 100% grain alcohol. <laughs> uh, way back when, uh, we used to be able to drink on board. Maybe World War I, World War II. And then some nutty guy, uh, uh, he was the uh, charge of the Department of War. We have Defense Department now. It was the War Department then. And... Uh, 
Joe Denning, something like that, he may have been Secretary of War or something, somewhere along that line, decided that we probably shouldn't be drinking before we go into battle. So he says, you could drink to the battle, or if it was football, you could drink to the stadium. You can drink after you come out, but when you get to the field, you can't drink. So that's what it started out as. And that wasn't too popular. And then a little bit later, he says, you know what? We don't need to drink at all. And he says, well, what the heck are we going to do? So he gave him coffee, and that's where the thing, have a cup of, on Joe, or a cup of Joe, because he gave him coffee instead of beer. So all the alcohol came off. Well, sailors being creative, they don't take suggestions, even if it's written or it's an order. So the torpedo men brought in homemade stills. And the reason they did that, to stop people from drinking that, they put a drug in it so it would make you sick if you drank it. So the still, they would just distill that and get it back to alcohol. So they go, hmm, that didn't work. And they even went to the cooks to get leftover the yesterday's bread to pour it through to get the Kool-Aid crystals out of it and would continue to drink. Ultimately, they turned it from uh, grain alcohol to wood alcohol. And the tanks and the leaks in the tanks went away. It didn't leak anymore. <laughs> and that, that's, a, that's a truth. So wood alcohol, why, is, why wood alcohol is that? I'm drinking wood alcohol, you can't drink that. That oh. makes you sick. Grain alcohol, you can drink, okay. but not wood. Oh, I see. Yes, it, it would run off alcohol. He didn't care if it was wood or grain. It, it, it is a non-denominational alcohol consumer. Yes, yes. And now, this, is, this ran on uh, alcohol. Uh, it has an, a combustible engine in the back, mm -hmm. and when that thing runs, you know, like on a jet ski, you got that trail behind it, which is kind of like splash, but this has a regular automobile exhaust behind it, and that's that white trail behind the torpedo. It's exhaust pipe, and that's what the enemy would see. Well, then they made that gray one, a Mark 16, and it's electric, so it's full of electric batteries. As opposed to non-electric batteries, boy, did I mess that up. It's full of batteries and it has an electric motor running it, just like the nuke, electric motor doing it. So, so, so no trail? No trail because there's no exhaust. Mm. And the engine in this one that ran alcohol, sort of a piston engine, like a yep, small motorcycle uh, yep, engine? Yep, wow. and bloop, off it would go. Wow, interesting. These are about 21 feet long, 21 inches in diameter. This probably weighs about 3,000 pounds. And to shoot this, we put water in the tube, we equalize it with the pressure outside, we open the outer door, then we just like a pen where you took the filler out and spit water, and you shot at the girl up front because you liked her. That's how we shoot these. So just a big blast of air, and it pushed that water column in it, and it took that torpedo from zero to 50 miles an hour in 20 feet. So that's that shock of acceleration, one of the things that requ is required to be sensed before it would arm himself and make it go boom. The computers would tell it, say, uh, do not arm yourself till 3,000 yards. Uh, and we would above. above. Is there anything you can show us around here about what any of these do real quick, Keith? Well, that sure. you happen to know? These are blowing vent manifolds. So when I open this vent, this opens the vent tube number one. So okay. then water can now come in and flood and you're venting the air out. I go, and it blows air into it. So I can blow the water back out of the tube. And, and there's six of them because there were six yes, tubes. So but, but the piping to this is not, was disconnected. They, so the valve is there, but the tubes associated are not there uh, because they were, moved, they were removed. They never removed the valves. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. What else we got? Uh, Oh my gosh, there's... So much? It's okay. Yeah, there, there's so much stuff. All this is uh, torpedo related. They'll come up and squeeze that trigger. If they get a green light, then everything is communicating right. And they say, okay, we're good. And they shoot it. Okay, interesting. So, uh... Okay. And these were air conditioners. Yeah. 
but it was made to keep the equipment cool. And after a while, they said, well, you know, maybe we should have a little more cool air. It's, it, these were not hot ships. There was so much air going through, you know, it could be 80 degrees, but the breeze made you feel cool. So, but it, it's still uncomfortable. But for hygiene purposes, they found air conditioning makes you not sweat. Who would have thunk of that besides Lennox? What's the humidity like? What was the humidity like? Oh, I, on the, it would be whatever the, is on the surface because we're sucking that air and the engines are pulling it through. So if you're in the South so Pacific, it's, it's going to be warm. And it's going to be warm. But the breeze going through, because it's moving, you just don't feel the real effect of 90 degree air. Okay, let's go up here and look at this. Okay, All right. This for? We were wondering oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see if there's anything in here. Okay, you take a piece of laminated paper and you put it in there. It says, if the ship is sinking, do this. If the ship is burning, do this. To sink the ship, do this. To, it, it, it's a step-by-step -step procedure. So when they go dive, you know, Prepare the ship to dive, and we do that in port because tomorrow we're going to dive. Open valve number seven, close valve number six. Ensure there's so much water in this tank, and this is all your preparations to go to sea. There'll also be another one that says prepare, uh, I, for lack of any other words, prepare for surface. Surface means you don't dive, so you shut all these valves that are critical to diving so there's that many less things that could go wrong and unintentionally dive. So when you pull in port, you fix the ship where it can't submerge, and that would be the rig for surface. If I have a fire, it says if the fire is in the after engine room, do this, 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 and this. Then these people tell control says the forward torpedo room is, is rigged for fire in the engine room. And they know the ventilation is lined up the way it's supposed to be. Prepare to emergency ventilate to blow the smoke out. To emergency, emergency ventilate the after torpedo room, open this, pull this arm, and they line all the valves up to most efficiently ventilate the ship to get the bad smells out. It's a procedure manual. Yeah, yes, it, yes. It's a step-by-step. Step, uh, forget to read this. <laughs> what, what's, what's all this? This is... High CO2. Yeah. This is a skate trunk. And the, normally for the torpedo room, quite, it, we, this is a weapons loading hatch. You don't come in and out of that. Because that hatch is, is an angle where it comes through. Uh, on some ships, you can. This ship, I don't think it is. This is an escape trunk, and quite often this upper hatch is open, so this is where the crew will come down if they work in the front. They've got one where they can go into the crew's mess, and maybe an engine room hatch that's open for the smelly engine men to go down. But if we were going to escape the ship, we would put four people in here, hmm. shut this door, open up a flood valve, Water from sea comes in and fills this chamber. With them in it? Yes, with them in it. Well, they'd be foolish if they were going to escape and not go in. And uh, if you look above this door here, well, it's not there. But there would be a little thing above that door that says flood line. And you fill that up to that part and you shut it. Then I come down here and I open up an air valve. <laughs> and it pressurizes that to sea pressure. Then you open that door. And now you can go right out into the ocean and up. Wow. I've got a lever that hooks up here. I pull that lever. It pushes the door shut. I let the pressure off, and the water pressure seals the door shut. I drain it down out the drain valve, and then put four more people in. Repeat. After I open it up, and you run four at a time. It might take a half an hour each trip to get four people out. And from what depth could you do that? Well, well there isn't that. really. If you're stuck at 800 feet, that's your only shot. Okay. You're going to do it from 800 feet. Okay. Fair enough. Decompression is a concern. Boy, you come up with all the right answers. <laughs> well, no, no, but that's good. Because yeah. let's say I'm down uh, 200 feet. How long can you stay down at 200 feet? Like Not long. Five minutes. <laughs> Maybe at the max five minutes without have experiencing uh, uh, DCS. So the corpsman's job on this ship is to come up here for emergency 
uh, leaving the ship. He brings a needle and he pokes a hole through your eardrums. Now remember I told you we pressurized that? He's going to pressurize from surface to 300 feet in about 30 seconds. So to get rid of the pain, that's why he pokes the holes in the eardrum so it's not an excruciating pain because you've got to operate that stuff. You can't operate in pain. Wow. So then they go out, and in a week, the eardrums heal over. <laughs> but, you know, it, you're down, you say, hey, I either do this or I die. And that's the position you're in. Yeah, eardrums would heal. Dying, you would yes. heal. <laughs> yeah, they don't have many, many survivors from de death. And... Uh, but that's what's there. You could put four guys in there, or maybe three girls, depending on whether they're taking the Gucci baggage or the Samsonite. Uh, so, oh, you were looking for something else, was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and so that's our escape trunk. Uh, over here, we have a signal ejector. That's just an itty bitty mini torpedo tube. And I can shoot these projectiles out. They're about four feet long, four feet in, in, in diameter where that's 21 feet long, 21 inches in diameter. That's this thing? Right yes. Here. So I put a, a little thing to shoot out, and those things can be like on the 4th of July, you got the Roman candles. I can shoot out a flare. I can shoot out a device that just smokes. I can shoot a combination that has a flare and a smoke, so when it hits the surface, someone can say, hey, there's something there that's a marker. I can get a message buoy from radio and say, hey, I'm flooding here. Or there's a convoy, an enemy convoy made up of a, and you, whatever message it is, and you shoot that out. And you say, transmit this in four hours. It floats up on the surface, four hours it, sits, it sends the message off. In four hours, we've cleared the area so the enemy can't zero in on the transmission and depth charges or drop bombs on us. Kind of cool, huh? The other thing that's cool is I can shoot a can of Alka-Seltzer out in the water. You don't know what Alka-Seltzer is, do you? If well, you got heart rate, blah, 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 blah die, really whatever, serious. this you take a pill and it fizzes and it gets rid of upset stomach and whatever. So the fizzing gets in the water. So I shoot that out, it goes plop, plop, fizz, fizz, and makes noise. Now the enemy doesn't hear the submarine. If they, and if they use modern weapons, the torpedo heads for the noise. And that's how, that's our evasive countermeasures from a weapon being shot at us. So that's what's there. Lastly, we have a, a head, which is nothing more than a government issued outhouse. It's got a fancy little pooper seat, kind of Guys like it. It's sterile. It's stainless steel. It, it just looks cool. All it is is a hole in the floor with a bowl on top. Anybody know, not know what a quarter turn valve is? Off quarter turn it's on. It's got a ball in there so nothing can go this way. Turn the quarter and then the hole will go through. A lot of your home faucets outside is a quarter turn. That's what's on the floor and it's a four inch ball valve. So if you got a turd bigger than four inches, it's going to go right through. Sometime or other, you have to empty that tank. So there's another valve outside the hull there, and we have to shut all the valves that has anything that drains in, because when we pressurize that tank, we don't want it blowing back out inside the ship. <laughs> now, let me tell you what goes in that tank. Your unused bodily parts that you may not, or things that you may develop, last night's macaroni and cheese, that's going in there. That sink drains in there. Can you imagine sitting there and <clears throat> getting blasted with the cruise? No. Okay, that goes there. Condensation in this ventilation line, ventilation line, there's a low spot in it where the water gathers and it drizzles down into that tank. So if you don't shut that valve, the whole ventilation line starts dripping from the ceiling. So, to blow sanitary, Bill, open this valve, shut this valve, do this, and it's a checkoff sheet, then report you're ready to blow the valve, blow the tank. Then you blow air into it, and we blow all the turkles out to sea, and we recycle to the fish who are hungry. <laughs> so they get to eat all that stuff. 
And, uh, and they don't care who it came from. It's just food for them. So anyway, that's the signal ejector. So was there a ship-wide announcement that would say when they would get ready to blow it? No. No? You hang a sign up and says, secured, blowing sanitaries. So what happens in the middle of blowing that sanitary when you get out of bed and you go, Ugh, and you walk in and you go open that valve, take the dump. You get a face full of it. It shoots all over the place, and probably for the next month, you're the person in here cleaning the walls every time you field day. You handle things at the lowest level. You normally don't do that more than once. Yeah. yeah. How, how many bathrooms heads were there on the ship? I've got one here, one in the one or two, two of them in the middle of the ship, and then one in maneuvering, which we'll get to. And I don't think the after torpedo room has one. I think they use the one in the maneuvering. About 60. Three. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, but when you have a mom, you need that, don't you? There you go. That's my bye guy. Okay, uh, the next compartment we go in is really kind of cramped for walking around. So, about all I'll say is that's officers' quarters. They have their eating area, the wardroom, where they do their training and eating and talking bad about the enlisted people. Uh, and they've got bunk spaces where they are at. There's a couple of them there that are set up as memorials, and I'll tell you about those people when we get to control. Uh, what's important is that is what's under the floor. This is called the Ford battery. What does that mean to you? It's in the front. And what's in it? No. Otherwise, they call it the Ford weapon. It's a battery. Remember, this is an electric ship. So the batteries that hold the power to turn the propellers is under the floor. So we've got like 256 of those batteries. They're about 14 inches, 14 inches, maybe four to five feet tall. They'll weigh anywhere from 1,000 pounds to 1,300 pounds a piece. And all they give you is two volts, and you can't light a flashlight with that. Hmm. But you hook them all up, and you got 250 volts. And that 250 volts on a DC motor can turn a whole lot of stuff. You know that Yugo that your mom drives? You'd have to put 10,000 pounds of these batteries in the back seat to listen to the radio. But you'd listen to it for the next 50 years. The battery, it would take that long for the battery to run down. So that's what's underneath the floor. That's why they call it the Ford battery. And since I specifically said Ford battery, something else must exist. A rear battery or an after battery. So you start looking for that after battery. And if I forget to tell you about it, you ask me. So anyway, we'll go through here. As we just before you step into the next compartment, look to the left. There's a little phone booth. There's a newspaper clipping. Just kind of get a quick glance at that, and I'll tell you about that when I get to control. Uh, let yeah. me run through here. Yeah, go, go ahead. Oh. That's the way you do it. That's how it really works. I hear you coming when I step aside. Whoa. Whoa. Yes. He's lucky. He's in that corner not hitting his head. How about your shins? You got a generation of shins. Yep, yep. My shoulder's messed up oh, from my shoulder imagine? catching it from going through it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can. Now, are you giving a pay tour? Are we in the way? No, no, if, okay. you, if you want to just listen, that's fine, but you're not part of the formal group. Gotcha. We didn't want to steal them. Uh, I, I, I would let you know if you were in the way. But you could, but you could easily just uh, get slipped by by uh, joining us. Sure, we're sure. Bay Area <laughs> divers. So. Oh, wow. Now. I want to switch all the switches. Well, I might let you play with some switches, but not all of them. Some of them are secret, and I can't tell you about them. Well, he could tell you about it, but then he has to kill you. Kill you, <laughs> that's right, to make sure nobody knows. Did you get that unlocked? Yeah. That'd be oh, a good, good way to go. I recognize that that key is shape. Uh -huh. I looked on the map, and it said the uh, after, after battery 
Creek is right below the Creek quarters. Yes, yeah. but we're not there yet. Yes. But it's good that you looked at that. There's How are you doing so far? Good. You won't get this on Carnival, even if they do have a good buffet. <laughs> there's, a, there's a model in there and one of the uh, officers' uh -huh. things, and it had an aircraft carrier, and that was an aircraft carrier this uh, well, the one thing you will song. notice is that mm -hmm. the yeah, head plays from an actual submarine are much smaller than they are on people. Hmm. Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> Here, Michael, do me a favor. Put this in the back of my backpack, please. Back for you. I got to do it back for you. You ain't getting any coins you drop down that. Okay, this is COC, most commonly referred to as COC. Which stands for? Center of Control. Center of Control. Yes. This is where we're going to, if you guys would like to go through simulating and diving the ship and whatever, you can kind of play with the communications and see just how much is involved. We can do that if you would like. Uh, you want to come through? There's 60 people on board, and it only takes about five or six people to run this thing. There'll be an officer of the deck up above. Submerged, there'll be a diving officer here. I have a chief of the watch over here. My lookouts become helmsmen and planesmen. This control, those big wheels control the wings in the front and the back. Control going up and down. Steering is done upstairs. Later, later submarines, the steering wheel was put over here. I can emergency steer it and take control away from him and steer here in case that gets flooded from somebody running over us. Uh, <clears throat> clear in the back corner, there's what's called a trim station, and I'll tell you about it. We have gyros, so we can electronic, you know, there are gyroscopes to say what direction we're going. They're relatively accurate, a couple hundredths of a degree or something like that. Uh, this is called an IC panel, so all the gyros and things like that go through here. What gyro is the ship going to do? His CO stateroom, which one does he want to use? What is fire control going to do? We pass these signals around the ship with them. <coughs> the gyro determines pitch? Anything. It, it's like the you know in school, the bicycle wheel, you turn, you can hold on one axle, just sits there, but if you turn, it rolls and whatever. It measures the amount of roll and says, now you've gone from north to northeast. Okay, so where do I go? And those electrical signals come up and drive, uh, well, we've got indicators saying what direction we're going and things like that. Uh, so with that, oh, over here we have an auxiliary man that stands here, and he runs all those valves. That's air. Underneath the floor, I have hydraulic pumps, some of the ship's hydraulic systems are down here. I have air compressors to pressurize the air banks back up whenever I blow ballast or use air. And he can open these valves and send air to the front, the back, whatever he needs. Uh, <clears throat> the guy in back has a manifold, which is a couple rows of valves. And he can say, suck from the back of the ship, discharge to the front, or suck from the front and discharge to the back. And he can pump water back throughout, back and forth through the ship to do this teeter-totter thing and balance it out. Once we're balanced, we're good. And we can't be heavy because we're only going two miles an hour. We're not going like 150 miles an hour where that'll lift an airplane off the ground. We're only going two, two or three miles an hour. So we have to be weighted just right. So in case we lose propulsion, we don't gradually sink. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. Is this a uh, hatch up to the conning tower? And I've unlocked that so you all can go up there and take a look out of a periscope. If you've got your cameras, you can put up and take some pictures out the window. Oh yay. Only, yeah. the, only, only the ones that come with cute girls are allowed to do that. <laughs> so if you're were a couple of girls short, somebody share. <laughs> now, there's one thing important. If you fire your torpedoes, you be sure and not sink one of those ferries because the si survivors are going to be pissed about their car. 
I'm going to open that up here in, in, in just a couple of minutes. Now, when we're on the surface in the daytime, this is the lighting that we have. Uh, at nighttime, we have to change the lighting because if you're going to send a watch from this into black, there it takes a long time for their eyes to adjust. So we alter the lighting in here, and they'll be sitting in here for like a half hour or so before they go up. We basically keep dimming the lights down. But we don't dim them, we just change the colors. Still coming. Oh, I can see that. <laughs> We're trying. Okay, this is white. Oh, wow. And this is red. So for about a half hour, the watches going topside will be in this light. Their eyes begin to adjust to darker lights. You can see everything in here because with all the lights, the panel lights and things like that, you can see really well. About 10 minutes before they go up, we do that and we just turn it black. Hmm. And then when they hit the roof, it may only take five minutes for their eyes to adjust, in which case they're talking to the guy who's coming down. So once he says, yeah, I see everything you see, the old guy knows it's time to come down and the new one takes over. Hi. Ugh. You ready? Come on through. Now, I told you I'd tell you some stories. Mm -hmm. And when, just before you came, walked in here, you looked at that phone booth, there was a picture there. And it's a couple old women holding the flag. Well, uh, back in World War II, they, you know, ships had battle flags. Airplanes had little sun rises on for every Japanese airplane they shot down. Well, we have a battle flag, and then they put a little insignia on for every ship we've sunk. This ship is sunk. Well, that's a picture of the ship's battle flag. And as the story goes, and I have no way reason to disbelieve it, the curator here went to, I think, Alabama. And he says, hi, Alabama. He says, hi, Galveston. They exchange pleasantries. And Alabama says, hey, I got something you'd be interested in. So he says, what's that? He says, this. He says, okay, so what? It took a while before he finally got it through Galveston's head. This is your ship's battle flag from World War II. So Galveston says, can I have this? And he says, oh, no. It's a one of a kind. So Galveston says, well, would you loan it to me, and I'll get it duplicated. He says, okay, I'll loan it to you, but I know if you bring me back a fake. So they had it here for quite a while, and they were looking for someone who would duplicate that flag. So one day, someone from the place here comes back and says, you know, I, I ran into these two old women at church. One was probably 80, the other 60 or something like that. And they said they would be willing to try to do that, but they wanted to see it first. So they took the flag to them. And the real old woman said, where did you get this? In short, she made the original in World War II and just happened to be in church that day, so she and her daughter made the replica of that flag. She says, I don't have the nimbleness to do it anymore, but I will do enough that you can say it was made by the original maker, and my daughter will do the rest of the stitching. Wow. wow. That's cool. Fact is often stranger than fiction. <laughs> so anyway, that's the story behind that. So everybody dry your tears. Are you, is your eyes dry now? Okay, we're ready to go on now. <laughs> Somebody, the guy in Alabama probably found it at an auction or something like that. Because someone probably took all the stuff off here. Someone died, says, hey, I have a battle flag I'll donate. So some crew probably donated it to the Alabama Museum, and he realized what it was. And I mean, this stuff, it's just strange with, with this stuff. There's a, uh, 
uh, aviation bar in the Philippines, when that closed down, that bar was taken to Alabama. The bar and everything, everything on the wall was taken out of it and set up in Alabama. So now you know what the Philippine Islands Air Bases Officers Club or whatever was, with all the original bar and everything. So you could go and says, I used to sit on this chair. <laughs> it's like that old adage, leave no man behind. Yeah, yep. There's so many one of a kind things, and the military is a very, very tight group. So, so anyway, let's try a few things here. First of all, in communications, whatever you're told to do, you repeat it back and you acknowledge that you understand it. So if I go, S you, what's your name? Sandra. Okay, Carol, Keith, smile. Smile. No, 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 you go, Keith, Carol, smile, I. So I know who you're talking to, I know who's telling me, and you're going to say I because I understand what you want. Okay, now start to smile. Okay, start to smile. Oh. No, no, that, when you start to smile, you're going to say, Keith, Carol, I'm smiling. I go, you're smiling, I, so now I know you've carried out what I've told you to do. This communication pattern goes on with everything. If I say, turn the light, rig for black, someone says, rig for black, I. COC, rig for black. We call it loop, loop communication. Yes, and that happens all the way throughout the ship because you can't afford to make a mistake. You know, shut and shoot are two different things. The weapons have been shot because someone said shut, meant to say shut, and they're, because they were from the east side of town and town, it came from out of shoot and a weapon got shot. So we don't use shut, we use the word close because it doesn't have any similarity to any critical function. So the whole military is based on that. So now if I say pump uh, after trim to four trim 10,000 pounds, what would you say? That was a mouthful. Pump, pump back to front, 10,000 pounds. Pump back to front, 4,000 pounds. Aye. Aye. Good, I know you understand what you're supposed to do. You start pumping, and what do you say? Thank you. Pumping aft to the front, 4,000 pounds. That's Done pumping, back to the front, 4,000 pounds. And you're going to be telling me this, and I'm going to acknowledge that I know what you've done. All that... <laughs> All that communication runs like that. We do that every day, but it's a different lingo. No, no, yeah. I understand, but it's the same general process. Mm -hmm. You just don't say yes. okay. No, because you, communication that's and right. knowledge. Mm -hmm. So does everybody don't say right? Yeah, so everybody kind of got a hang of that. Okay. I'm going to let you be chief of the watch. You're in charge of all those levers there. That opens up the vents and makes us sink. Cool. So you're going to be the bad guy. You're going to be sinking us, and. Uh, uh, the ship you're going to be the water pumper <laughs> okay. because you're the cute one. There's only a cute chair back there. So, so since we have a cute chair and not a chronic chair, then you can be, you're the pumper and you're going to be a, a, a diver. So you're going to be running these wheels and you're going to go over and grab the other wheel. So when I say I want to go up, you turn, you, you turn the wheel to the left. When I want to go down, you turn the wheel to the right. If I tell you to do something, you repeat back. So if I go, go down to 150 feet, you go, go to 150 feet, I, and tell me when you're at 150 feet. So we got the water pumper. We got the divers. We got the chief of the watch to open the vents. Now I need, uh, why don't you be my blow girl? <laughs> and you're gonna all worse. <laughs> well haven't we all well i'm talking about the air manifold so you'll be blowing ballast tanks but i like the way you're thinking <laughs> you're going to be the auxiliary man okay. now up here you'll see uh blow to the after group that's the ballast tanks back out blow to the forward ballast tanks did each of these have a, a crank, or was it... Oh, there will be one of these kind of T-hemp, bang, 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 and just pretend. Yeah. Just pretend it's a football game. You just go right along with it, and you say you like it. Okay, so if I go, blow the Ford group. Aye, aye. But Jennifer, no. Keith, Jennifer... Blowing the Ford, blow the Ford group, aye. Okay, so now you're now when you're here, this is going to be an important step for you. You got to go. 
<laughs> to make the sound of air. Yeah, sound effects and shaking. And, and when I say we need secure blowing the forward group. Secure blowing the forward group, I. Very good. Yes, yes. And then you, you tell it. me when it's actually done, and which I'll know because you're not going to go <laughs> anymore. So you got the forward group and the after group. Okay, we got that. And so we got him, we got those guys, we got you, we have our film guy. Yes. And uh, I'm going to be over here, and I'm going to play diving officer. Not captain? <laughs> no, 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 no. He'll be up there. Okay. So when I'm babbling along, this will be communications up and down. And you know I'm talking to you because I'm going to say auxiliary man. I won't use blow girl. I'll use auxiliary man. <laughs> Chief of the watch, helm. We have our Pumper. planes, and we have our pumper. All, pumper's good. And by the way, here's all your levers to lower the, lower the antennas. So if I go lower all mast and antennas, you go lower all mast and antennas, I pretend like you do that. <clears throat> okay, these two guys are originally up on the roof. And they got their binoculars. <coughs> so the officer deck says, all hands below prepare to dive. And you come jumping down, you come running through here, and you sit on the chair and you're getting ready to do this. The officer deck comes up and he takes his position up there. He's got the upper doors shut. You're going to come up and look at that panel and say, upper hatch indicates shut. Upper, cat, upper hatch indicates shut. Yeah, the lights aren't there. But see, then you have an indicator for every hole in this submarine that can flood us. Yeah. So it'll be the upper hatch indicates shut. And uh, we'll just kind of go from there. We'll just see how much of a fiasco we can make out of this. <laughs> okay, are you ready? We're ready. Officer the deck's up in the thing, and he says, diving officer, submerge the ship. I go, submerge the ship, officer deck dive, I. And I go on the one MC. Dive, dive. <laughs> <laughs> dive, dive. Chief of the watch. Vet bow buoyancy in the forward group. Venting bow buoyancy. bow buoyancy in the forward group. Buoyancy in the forward group, aye. Do it. <laughs> We're venting. <laughs> From the office of the deck, he's looking through the periscope. Forward group is venting. He's seeing this water plume go up. That's the physical verification that you open that up. Forward group venting, aye. Sure. Vent the after group. Venting after group, aye. After group venting. After group venting, I. After group is venting. After group spinning, I. Decks are awash. Decks are awash, I. Your planes are down. Make your depth six zero feet. That's good. And we're doing that now. As as a ship is going down, all the rest of the air is coming out. What's that off to the deck? Forward group no longer bending. I close the forward group. Closing forward group. I close the after group vents. Closing after group vents. Off to the deck. All vents are closed. Proceeding to six zero feet. All right. No, no, I'm talking to him, not you. I'd, I'd say plainsman if I was talking to you. <laughs> See how important this communication is. What depth are we at? Uh, six zero feet. Off deck at six zero feet. Request a one third trim. Go ahead, dive, do a one-third trim. I like speed. I'd like to go two-thirds speed. He tells the engine room, go ahead, two-thirds. Water pumper, pumper after trim to forward trim. We're heavy, we're heavy aft. I, I get it. <laughs> what are you supposed to do? Um, shut the water. Pump after trim to forward trim. Pump after trim to forward trim. 10,000 pounds. 10,000 10, pounds. I. I. Start doing it. Are you moving water? Uh, yeah. Dive. <laughs> Diving officer. Pumping after trim to forward trim. 10,000 pounds. <laughs> now start counting out. 1,000 move. 2,000. When you get to 10,000 move, you tell me that you've got 10,000 move. Now, we're sitting here trying to stabilize out. And you're trying to get these planes where they're just straight ahead. If there's any bit of lift, I'm going to be taking the weight off the ship so you don't have to fool with it. At 10,000 pounds, I... Plainsman, make your depth. 150 feet. Taking depth 150 feet. Okay, that's a good answer. Up in that clock. 
Yeah. Off to the deck, we are at 150 feet. What's that? The other is, Go to periscope depth. I make your depth six nine feet. Prepare to surface. I. No, not you. I'm not talking to you. I'd say plainsman if I was talking to you. You're going to six nine feet. You're going to tell me when you get to six nine feet. At six nine feet. At six nine feet. Steady. I off the deck. We're steady at six nine feet. Surface the ship. Surface. Oh, yes. Nice. Radar. Here. Here's your radar. Put left foot over here. And uh, then you can. Oh, yeah. Entrance is over here. Okay. So we have Let's radar. Radar. The, the quartermaster has his charts back there. The officer can look and see what's going on. So this is a very, very tight space. It's nowhere near as spacious as what the World War II movies make it look like. Yeah, you can say that again. Wow. Okay. What okay. was this? The what? Okay. This is set looking at the other shore. You have power and you have looking up and down. Huh. So you can stick your eyeball up there and, for instance, there, um, I'm looking up and down. Wow. Yep. I can and see. And then that. over here we should have oh. low, high power. Oh, yeah. And then I, I can go to super high power too. Wow. I wonder if I can get that on the camera. I doubt it. But it might be worth a try. Oh, goodness, it's really dark. I, th <laughs> I thought that was awful white on that screen. <laughs> yeah, it's really dark. But so, yeah, it, it's very crowded up here. And during yeah. battle stations, you probably have six or seven people up here. This one came out pretty good. Ah, yes, yes, good. That was a good pick. It's only if you take it from the front. So actually... Yeah. <laughs> and what is this back one? Is this the... This is, this is going to be the attack... The, Navigation scope, and this is the one with the tall, with that the, the taller one with the real thin neck that sticks. Oh out. yeah, the right. Pencil, not uh -huh. kite. And behind here, what is this? The quartermaster has his naval charts out here where we're at in the ocean. Okay. So he can tell the officer deck just exactly where we're at. Hmm. And then the torpedo data computers. Yes, these? and this is where the sonar and everything comes in here that they plot. That, that this calculates by input what direction you have to shoot the torpedo in based on the target speed and distance to, you know, to where they'll cross right. paths at the same time. Right, right. Wow. And then front. It looks a lot like a toilet. Yep, but it's not. But it's not. There's a valve there for something, and I don't know what piece of equipment was there. Okay. But uh, there used to be a piece of equipment. Huh. Otherwise, no space is left unused. And then over here? Kate? That's the steering wheel. That's the helm. Huh. So this one you look at, Drew. This is the, the scope here. Here's the eyepiece on this side. Okay. But it, I think this one is broke. I don't, okay. don't know what. This one you just can't see through. So these pods on the bottom are just for them to rest on, or just for no? Them th this is this is covering them. the hole. This thing's going to go oh, down oh, twenty feet right. to the bottom of the ship. The, I saw the uh, cylinders down there. In the yes, upper, yes, yes. Upper room. And it just doesn't have this shield on it and whatever. Okay. And uh, so here's radar. What? That that's it's a radar. wave guy. It's that's a wave guide. You don't use wires to transmit radar. It goes through just a pipe and it bounces around because wow. it's so high frequency. Wow. And then that bolts on to here, and that's the bottom of the... Yeah. Hmm. So cool. Yes, it is. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, it pulled this lever, and that shifts the hydraulic valve, makes this go up and down. Okay, but it's all the way up, presumably. Yes, we, yeah. we just leave, leave it, it that way, yeah. That way it looks cool from outside that there's a periscope up. Right, right. Wow, this is super interesting, Keith. And then up here... Is the hole that's inside the, the, the sail where the watches and the officer deck go. So the watch. Oh, okay. So the, at the front there we looked at with yes, the windows. Yes, yes. Well, I couldn't get the door open. Yeah. That window is right here. Okay. So you drop down here, you close that door. That's where he said upper hatch is shut. That's yeah. that hatch. I gotcha. And that's for diving. 
Yeah, you, when you want to get the ship watertight so you can take it down. It's a bad, the, the, in officer school, they teach them it's bad to submerge a submarine with the door open. <laughs> <laughs> what is this panel for? I don't know. Fair I, enough. Fair enough. Depth, uh, enable, run. Okay, this is going to be what you sit and transcend the orders to the torpedo. Uh -huh. Enable runs will say, you'll set it at, say, 3,000 yards. The weapon will activate the warhead at 3,000 yards. All right, you control the torpedo, torpedo from this Yes, yes, you, this is what sends all the parameters to the torpedo to oh, tell right. it what to do. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, it'd be wonderful if we, if we could get all this stuff working, but, uh, oh, hey, well, yeah, let's see what we have. Nav lights, that would yeah, be come on. red. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. There we are! Well, that's better. Whoever wants that to come bad? up, Should I have not done that? whoever wants to come up, come on up. We have lights. We can see. <laughs> oh, now this looks all together different, doesn't it? This is better. Oh, Let me get a thank quick you. Run around now, to... Here's something that we have. When you look through the periscope, you see all those little marks? That's like trigonometry, a quarter of a degree or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you count how tall a ship is by how many divisions is. And this is a slide rule. Oh, yeah. And so we, die, we, we turn this and say, well, he's 70 feet high and he's five divisions on that, therefore he's 11,000 yards away. And they dial, the ship is 11,000 yards away into here. Right, right. Sonar, how fast is he going? He's going 12 knots. They dial 12 knots going in. Hmm. He looks at him and says, I've got, see, his right-hand side at about 60 degrees, and they turn that ship. So now they know where he's going to be at, and we just follow it to see if those guesses hold true. Hmm. If so, then we say, where do, what direction we have to shoot the torpedo to intercept him? Wow. Hmm. Have I seen in the submarines where they can just look through and it's underwater? And where, I wonder where that is. That, that's what this is. These are the periscopes. You got it? Okay. Good enough. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're doing perfect. You're doing perfect. Ah, uh, perfect. Yes. Yeah, they took the handle so we couldn't, it can't be unscrewed. Mm, if I put a wrench on it, it would open that up. I hope this is kind of entertaining to some point. Oh my gosh, are you This kidding? is really And we're only one third of the way through the ship. This is really great. I know as a child, I came here for a school uh, mm -hmm. tour. But, but you just got to walk through the space, yeah. a very patronizing yeah. trip. Would you yeah. hold that I note? certainly will. I'm sure I, I knew that I would appreciate it more and understand it more as an adult. And we can't let later. people up here because they bring tools and they steal knobs and stuff for souvenirs. Oh, no. And, 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 yeah, I, I want to hand him his camera. Got it. Thank there you, you Keith. Go. Okay, and you've got the footsteps yep. down, right? Good. Oh, where are the switch you did? What, where's that? This one right here that says lights. Here? Yep. Tired of the captain. Turn the disco ball back on. I still need to come up here. Is there somebody else that needs to come up just, too? Just one quick left. Okay. In the movies where all you hear is the beep, beep. Is that only in like the radar room where you hear the boom? That, that's a sonar. They're, they're, they're going bing. We're sending the sound out. It echoes back. And we know it takes roughly, uh, runs about 5,000 feet per second. So we count the seconds it goes out and counts it when it comes back. And if that's uh, 10 miles, you know, enough for 10 miles, that's 10 miles two directions. So they're five miles away. Today's equipment counts that on its own. And then it puts a little spot on the radar tube or sonar tube. And so we just slide a little marker out. You know, put the, take the cursor, it says 5,000 yards. And then we just keep that and we just track it as it moves along. Can't use Google Maps? No, no, they're, they're only good from the surface and above. But you're thinking. Yeah. I wouldn't put that, good, that quality of thinking on your resume just one yet. Day, one day, one <laughs> day. That's the question over here. Okay. Oh, I thought if I turned my back, you'd remember. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll remember in the next section. How many folks were typically in this area? On the surface, you had a chief of the watch, 
and an auxiliaryman. No, just the two. And then you just had some guy running around delivering messages or just uh, and and looking at gauges throughout the ship. He's got several pages he fills in every hour. And then comes up reports, everything's okay. Oh, no, we're leaking back here. Okay, initiate repairs, whatever happens to be. So. Uh, and then the guys from up top would come down and do the. Yes, the lookout jump in here. The officer of the deck takes charge in here. They call a diving officer out of his bunk and says, you come up here and take this position because you're going to coordinate the diving of the ship and the surfacing of the ship on his orders. And so when we opened up the main bench, you looked at the periscope, he could look at the forward deck and say, yep, we got a plume of foam coming out. The vents actually did open and we are venting. He'll say, okay, they're not venting anymore and the deck is underwater, shut the vents. So it's a very cord, it, it's a waltz, it's a dance to make this stuff work. But it's so routine, people just do it in their sleep. During active time, you had an officer in every section? Every That's him up there. That's but, the officer, period. That's the only one we got doing anything. But in, like in this area, he's up there, but you've got people working here. You don't have a diving ready. officer. He just talks through the hole and says, here's what I want you to do. He tells the control room what he wants to do for him. Okay. He controls speed and steering. Everything else is done down here. And the diving officer is the one that controls this. Right? Yes, I make sure this whole control is, is, is working in harmony and, and working together to get done what needs to be done. So when you were on submarines, were you in this area? No, I was in another little room with headsets listening to what, what was out there, okay. sending bearings to that fire control system so we can pretend to shoot them. Did we pass that spot up front? This ship didn't have it. Uh -huh. Now, when they put the sonar in, underneath that deck plate, there's a room down below that uh -huh. used to be a machinery space. Mm. And they said, well, we're going to get rid of the machinery space so we can put the sonar you know, consoles in it so they can go down and listen to their Walkmans. In World War II. Oh, come on. I need more of a... Where, where's my Walkman in World War II? No. Okay, good, good. Now I'm all back. I'm reset. 82, uh, but not 40. <laughs> there we go. So uh, maybe the only other thing maybe to look at is this panel here. Every hull opening has a switch on the door to say if it's open or shut. A lot of those lights aren't working, but the zeros mean something's open. That? Is that a zero? Uh -huh. Okay. That there's an open door. If it's a straight line, it's shut. That used to be red and green, but green put out too much light. So if you rig for black, everything there had green bars on it, and it just flooded the room with light. So they went red because it's easier for your eyes to adjust. So they, they used to refer to something like that as the Christmas tree because of red and green. Now they just call the hull opening panel but when you dive, you say, I have a straight board, which means all straight lines, no O's. Ah. So uh, dive, diving officer, how are you ready to dive? Yes, we have a straight board ready to dive. He'll order the dive. The diving officer executes it. And there's probably more people in here than there is anywhere else in the ship. Hmm. So one, two, three, four, five. That's about the most populated area we have in the ship. When it's when submerged. Mm. So, if there's nothing else in here, <laughs> we'll go to the next room. Very good idea. Let's go do it. Here's our ship's announcing system. Every alarm, flooding alarm, and whatever is, is generated, the noise is generated here and it's spread over the loudspeakers, except for the diving alarm. We can't afford to have the diving alarm run out of power. So if this poofed up and we had an emergency surface, we can't signal anybody. Diving alarm, alarm comes off of 120 volts AC. So that's the ooga, ooga. Collision, flooding, everything else goes here. Can I turn it on? The who? Can I turn the collision alarm on? Go ahead. Uh -oh, uh -oh. Ears. Ears. The panel shut off. It ain't gonna make any noise. Ah. But he, but but he can sure operate that lever. <laughs> Garbage disposal. Just another fancy torpedo tube. You put the garbage in and shoot it out. Radio room, one of the most spacious rooms we have. 
Even Greg has spent his hours in here. Okay, let's go on in. And By the way, the Cat, five, the cat 6 network ain't cable through here, not original to the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Greg did a, put a lot of hours in here pulling this stuff. And, and one day we're going to get it working. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to get it working. Antenna part yeah. pointed correctly. Yeah. Before the days of conservation. Yeah. Is that original too? What? Is that original too? Yes, but it took several decades for the, them to get the technology to talk to it. Okay, this is the cruise mess. Clearly, you can see we eat, we play games. If there's training to go on board, like how to be sensitive or whatever, that training would go on in here. They do two or three sessions, and then XO says, I've told everybody, and send it to the Pentagon, said we've done our job. Uh, I had a, a group come through here several months back. And the, the, there's a man, a wife, and a couple kids. And she just said, man, this just seems so glum. This, I don't think I like this. So I says, well, the next space we go into may be more to your liking. You might feel more at home. And she says, well, why would he think I like that? And the kid goes, mom, there's the kitchen. If I had $10, I would have put that in his college fund because he's surely going to learn a lesson off of that one. But <laughs> uh, down below is a refrigerator. In fact, it's a freezer. So when you bring your, your food in, you put all your frozen goods on the outside and you put your refrigerated goods in the middle. By the time they can even freeze in the middle, you've already consumed your milk and your, your perishables. But it's packed with steaks and all that type of stuff. Yes? There's a hatch above your head. How do they get up through that hatch? There, you, a ladder would attach on here and go down and you would climb out. Now, remember the sail when we came up? and we hit the back of the sail, and then we went to the front and saw the periscopes, this is the back of the sail. That's that hatch you step on there. And of course, the kitchen back there, uh, coffee pot, very important piece of equipment on here. How uh, often would uh, provisions get replenished? Whenever you pull in port, uh, I, they would have to carry like 60 days of food on board, but that's gonna be uh, sea rats, Anybody know what sea rats are? Yes. What is a sea rat? Well, I'm thinking of the sea ration from the army. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. I, I, I was depending on that. So it's meals. It's all in a can. What are A-rats? I don't know A-rats. Milk. Short lifetime, quick to perish. Then the more you go down the alphabet, the longer they last. Okay. I thought you were talking about C, like S-E-A. No. C, A, B, C, D, E. C. It's a category. Sea rats can last for a couple years. Okay. Then you got your A rats, which is going to be like milk who, who won't last a week or whatever. So that's your A rations, your C rations, and whatever. Everybody thinks C stands for can, so I don't know what A stands for. So I imagine they used a lot of like powdered cans. Oh, p plastic eggs? <laughs> Pour it out of the package, just stir it up with water, there's your scrambled eggs. It, it, yes, yeah, that, that, that would be your canned stuff. Like, Yes, yeah. yeah. So was the food good, Keith? Forever. Was it good? Well, you know, uh, they, if we had uh, uh, scalloped potatoes, it was sea rats. You took it out and they dumped it in a pan, let it soak for four hours, and then they cooked it up. They rehydrated it by just sitting it in water. So powdered milk and... Um, After a week, he was drinking plastic milk or powdered milk, plastic eggs, plastic cheese. Uh, a lot of things are plastic. A couple things that were good though, to cook the Navy requires, or to, on the table, they are required to serve butter. Up till about 1980 or 85, they had to use butter to cook with. They, uh, they gave them some slack and said, you can use oleo or margarine to cook yeah. with, but on the table, it must be butter. Oh, that's good. Now, 
Submarines, how much sunlight do you think we get in here? Not a whole lot. So what vitamins do you get from the sun? D. What are sources of vitamin D? Milk. Milk? But that's gone after a week. Oh, yeah, vitamin D has to be added to milk. Uh, it doesn't meat. have it. Meat. What good yeah, meat. What red, else? Red meat. Seafood. Seafood. Every Friday, surf and turf. New York strip. Uh, ribeye, shrimp. We get that every week to as our supply of vitamin D. The skimmer pews, I mean the people who sail on tar on ships, <laughs> they don't get that because they can walk out on the deck and get your vitamin D. What do you call it? Skimmer pukes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unless they're smart. Yeah. <laughs> they refer to us as bubbleheads. Okay. And I wear that badge proudly. Okay. That's good I to resemble know. that remark. <laughs> so yeah, fart suckers. Yeah, that's another word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question so, for you, Keith. So did, yeah. they have, did they have freezers? Did they have who? A freezer? Or right there. Right there. Okay. That's, that's the freezer. Gotcha. Mm. So, Keith, you mentioned the boat was 99% of the time on the surface. Yes. Did anyone hop out to do some fishing? No, because you're running along at maybe 8 or 10 knots uh -huh. going from point A to point B. Couldn't well, stop, do some fishing? You could if you were ahead of schedule. Okay. And quite a few. Now, every four hours, you have to send a message to... in. East Coast, it would be to Subland. If you're on the West Coast, it goes Subpat, Atlantic Pacific. And that would be the submarine commander. And you have to say, this is my current position, this is my speed and course, and you're required to make maintain what's called a PIM, Planned Intended Motion. So you can alter by a couple miles an hour but you don't want to get too far ahead by the end of the next four hours because if you don't report, they go, this is where you should be and here's the area we have to look for carnage. So if we was going to have a swim call, Captain would say, we're going to do 10 knots, a 10 knot pin going west. Okay, so we do 12 knots and after eight hours, we're 16 miles ahead. That's two hours on the surface, so we have a two hour swim call. Next message goes off, we're exactly where we said we were going to be. <laughs> So does everybody actually jump off and swim? <laughs> yes, because you can't take a shower on here. We have showers, but we don't have enough fresh water to do that. Huh. This runs off batteries. And if you get in the ocean, you need a shower. Well, well, but you can walk through and just rinse the salt off. You're not scrubbing. You're not using 20, 30 gallons. You're just... And since soap doesn't work in salt water, you have to get salt water soap. Shaving cream, there's salt water shaving cream because it won't foam in salt water. So it's funny getting Fat Albert out there floating in the ocean, shaving in the middle of the ocean because he doesn't have enough water on here to shave with. <laughs> that water's got to be saved for the cooks, the people who handle food, coffee pot definitely, uh, and nobody takes showers except for maybe the cook every other day and he doesn't even take a shower, he takes a bird bath. So he'll go in the sink and he'll uh, get a little bit of water, and that's what he does all his cleaning with. It does not take long to learn that you brush your teeth before you shave. Oh, Even the army caught on to that one. <laughs> Most of them just don't shave, so that's why you see so many uh, shows that says, you got the clean cut surface guys and these scraggly submariners because they don't have water to shave. Did they have to carry their fresh water or could they be selling it? We, We'll get to that. We have w fresh water tanks that we fill up, but that if everybody took a shower, it'd be gone in a couple, two or three days. So we don't take showers, so we have to make, we fill all our water tanks up. We say it's gonna be 12 days till the next port. We have to make that water last. We are limited to the amount of diesel we have. So that starts controlling how many engines do we run? Do we run four engines at 14 miles an hour or go down to three engines and do 12? When we get to the engine room, you'll understand why that's important, why one engine can make a lot of difference. Uh, other than that, uh, that's about all there is in here. What about fresh water? These days, so they can make fresh water. Oh, yes. We have megawatts of electricity. We're making water, 10, 10 to 25,000 gallons a day of water. You can shower every day. So if someone goes like that, you say, hit the shower. Yeah. And they'll go take a shower and whatever. So... Uh, we would bring fresh fruit on in port because that's the only time we would get fresh vegetables and fruit and we would consume them down before they go bad. Scurvy, uh, yeah.
Okay, let's come on back here. Oh my gosh. Here's the guy who's right on top of things. Step in here. This is this compartment is formally called the after battery. Under the floor here we have another 128 of those battery cells, which now gives us a total of 256. So uh, that's where we get our 500 volts from to turn the motors and whatever. Uh, there's another room that controls how it's connected. This is also a 21-man bunk room. The corpsman sleeps in here because it's the middle of the ship. He can run to either end as needed. Escape, ship escape, he goes forward. Any If there's an injury, then he goes wherever he's needed. The corpsman does not sleep with anyone else. He has a bunk of his own. He does not swap cooties with anybody. Hmm. Everybody else is three people sharing two bunks. Two guys sleeping, the third one on watch. So they're just alternating back and forth between bunks all the time. You'll have, I guess, theoretically, 60 people but 40 beds. So you've got to split these beds up. They refer to that as hot bunking because the mattress never gets cold. Right, there's always someone asleep in this. And yes. It's always yes. full of sleeping people. Yep. Mm. Except for the ones that are on watch. And, yeah. and yeah. So 21 people, this will now sleep 31. 21 beds, 31 people. Asleep? Oh, then everybody's up and they're they're all on their, their most proficient watch locations and areas of skill. So is there more than one corpsman or is there just one? One, corpsman? just one. one. Mm -hmm. okay. And he keeps yeah. your, your records stuck in those lockers and, and things like that. So the corpsman gets the back bunk? Well, I, I don't know. Our corpsman had the one up there. But they, they'll have space as these are the corpsman's records, and he's usually right by his his, his records. But uh, I that, guess all the personal possessions have to fit in one of those little yes, lockers? Yes, all these little uh, lockers. Uh, I had two of those lockers. So everybody's got two of these lockers to put all your stuff in. And if you open that up, there's pipes running behind. So if you just throw something in, it might fall down to the bilge, unless it's in a bag or something. <laughs> Once again, this is not uh, Carnival, even the worst Carnival ship. This is not as luxurious as, as Carnival is. Yeah. There's a main vent operator the whole, that opens and shuts one of the vents that's under the deck. That just pushes a plunger up and down through the hole, and that, through some levers, opens up some vents underneath the wooden deck. Okay, let's move on through. We have a couple heads here. Uh, I think they say one's for the first class, and uh, the, the other one is the regular crew. You can see the toilets are not that luxurious. We have a shower back here. The shower is normally used to store trash. Then once every couple of weeks, we have a parade and hand bags of trash, take them up top, throw it over the side, feed the fish. This is a humongous engine. Yes. I'm about to tell you the story of that. That that that's one of our ongoing stories that we've been doing as we've been, we've been walking through the ship. Now, uh, remember, I told you they took two torpedo tubes out to put uh, sonar in. And in control, they, they took out a machinery space to put the sonar control room in. You know what was in the machinery space? That lathe. So they brought the lathe from there and they put it in here. They took an engine out to make room for that lathe. Because in World War II, you made so many of your own parts, shafts and things like that. You couldn't just say, uh, go to Sears, give me part number A1524-5 and have a plane delivered at the airport. So everything is very basic in construction that they can make most everything on board. Now these engines, uh, the earlier versions of these were train engines. 
So even today's train has a diesel in it and it runs a generator and it's an electric drive that turns the wheel. So the Navy saw it and they said, wow, this 12-cylinder engine seems to be pretty good and somewhat reliable. Can you make me one to put on a submarine? And they said, okay, what do you need? He says, we need this much horsepower. He says, we don't have that. We'd have to turn our 12 into a 16-cylinder. They said, but we'll do it. General Motors now made a 16-cylinder V block, 1,600 horsepower with a supercharger, about 1,500 and change without a, without a supercharger. Uh, there's 1,600 cubic inches here, 1,600 on, cubic inches on the other side, and consumes a gallon of diesel fuel a minute. So that's where you really have to watch your rationing of the fuel, how many engines you run, and whatever. Uh, if you look up here, you'll probably see the hole where that glass cover was on, where the air dumps into the engine room. Yeah, that you're looking underneath the there, and when it went that way, that was that plexiglass cover. So that's as big of the hole where the engine dumps in the engine room. The wind is, can be somewhat torrential if you get under here. Your hair is just matted down. Even in uh, the summertime, quite often the engine men are wearing jackets because they just get chilled. Even if it's 80 degree air blowing in, they're getting chilled because of the, like the wind effect. So uh, that's what they do there. So, what, so the, what happened to the engine? The, the, how many engines does this have? It uh, originally had four. All right. I two see. here and two in the after end room. They oh. took this engine out to save the lathe. I see. And, uh, of course, that's changed in later years. Oh, it's searching. Okay. Hey, uh, one other thing. Yeah, we're at, they were asking about oh, this. Oh, wonderful. In the Ford. Uh, let's see. Actual pages Here it. is, yes, who, 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 know, who knows how to read? <laughs> Anybody? You? Okay. okay, read the flooding bill to everyone. So anyway, that's uh, there. Now in the after end room, it's going to be pretty much like this, except we don't make water, we make air conditioning. And then we pump that cold air through the ship. So these things start up, it sucks a lot of air. So I can, so when we have an officer on, on the roof with the lookouts, air comes barreling down through the conning tower into the control room, comes right through the hallways, and you can suck a lot of farts out of the spaces for the engines to burn up. Well, that's okay. Just don't tell anybody. On the back of the engine, there's a generator, and that, that makes the electrical power that the next space is going to divert to the battery or divert to the motors to turn the motors. Things are going to start moving a bit faster now. Now where was it? When we were going up the ladder into the sail, where was that? COC? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that was up into the uh, conning tower. Whew, nice and cool here. A little bit cooler? Yeah. <laughs> Wait till the middle of August. <coughs> Two more engines. Okay. Okay. Air conditioning. Yes. Air conditioning plants down below. Other than that, here's the two engines. So the room behind this looked like this one originally. The one behind us was different in that it had water making machines oh. instead of those two items. Which are. So there's just a slight relocation of things. Okay. And the air conditioning is down here under the floor. Uh, I told you when you first came up the ladder that that was the back of the engine room. There's the hatch over on the other side that goes up there. Here's where the air dumps into the after engine room from more piping underneath the deck. This next room is very crowded. Uh, you can see a cage up here, and that cage consumes almost the entire room. So the battery cables from up front and in the after battery, those cables plug into there. It, these generators plug into there. The electric motor connectors plug into there. This is where the actual propulsion of the ship is controlled. 
So it's very cramped and uh, there'll be, a, just on the other side, there'll be a bunch of levers you move to connect batteries, to do things, to make it go forward, backwards, how fast you go, and things like that. I'd spend some time there, but we got so many people here, it would just take forever. So we'll go through here, get a look at it. If you have any questions. You can stick your head and look through these holes. These are all the bus bars and the levers and manual operated relay connectors. There must have been some electric motors here somewhere. The here. motors is underneath and goes back, and that's oh. where the propeller shafts connect to go oh, back. Right, right. These are the levers, says forward, back, speed controls, engine uh, information, that type of thing. And this guy talks to the conning tower because when they say I had two thirds, this goes cling cling. Oh. Mm -hmm. So he's this thing talks to the conning tower. Uh, oh yes, here we go. Room that we came in first was the torpedo room. Ford torpedo room. Ford torpedo room. Oh, so this is the ass. Oh, you know what? You can't get anything past you, can we? <laughs> it's a good thing because I said that nuclear torpedo belonged in the back. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So here we have two tubes. They're above. There's no tube underneath the floor because the propeller shafts are going underneath the floor. So just four back here instead of six yes. instead of up front. Look at that man. Yeah, the bunks right here. Mm -hmm. And these are skid bunks because they slide out like drawers. So when they're out, there's a little walkway about this big. So how many torpedoes would this submarine uh, carry? I see four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Four more of the tubes so we can have ten back here. And I think we can get like 14 up front. Okay. Something mm -hmm. like that. So when you run out of bullets, you go home. <laughs> and then with chain falls, you're lowering them through the thing here. They're manhandling them and putting them where they go. I told you about these little kind of railroad track rails that we roll things around on. Your left arm is on one. Your other left arm. <laughs> yeah, my wife does that too. So there's this, you have this here so you can move back and forth this way. This thing, you can see how that hooks in there, also hooks in down there, so once on the bottom, you can move it back and forth. So how many did they carry? On here, about 24. 24. Maybe 14 forward and 10 back here. You run out, you go home. Yep. So there was always more waiting for them wherever they were going to go. Well, you to. pull in, you go, Sasebo, we need uh, six mark 14s. And when you pull in, your operation's over with. So they say, we're sending you out on another patrol. And they load you up full and send you out. How did they get these torpedoes in here? See this? This had the floor cut out. You can see the holes an inch thick. So oh, this right. was like a diagonal, somewhat of a diagonal hatch that went there. This one goes straight up. Okay. But this is a loading hatch that they took out. Oh, okay. So a crane comes up and dangles it in here, and then we chain fall and do this stuff, get it up, put these rails underneath, sit it down on the rail, push it over, strap it down, say, next torpedo, please, and that's an hour from now. Doing the mm -hmm. dance. Yes. Wow. These torpedoes weigh how much each? Oh, about 3,000. Mm. Wow. All right. <laughs> so this is where we normally head top side because it gets pretty warm back here. Don't think it's going to be much cooler out here. Margarita machine, anything? Anyway, there's your submarine. That was incredible. You're welcome. You're welcome. Down here, there's a uh, kind of a memorial for the submarines that was lost in World War II. There's a plaque for each and every one that didn't come back. They're referred to as ships that are still on patrol, eternal patrol. 
Uh, there will be a plaque up there for Seawolf. Uh, they named this after the, the USS Seawolf, and her sister ship sunk Seawolf, mistakenly. Really? Yes. I didn't hear that story. Uh-huh. What is that story? They pulled up in the Pacific. Seawolf says, hey, we want to join up in the pizza party. And one of the ships thought it was a Japanese ship trying to portray itself as an American ship. So they said, oh, we're not going to let them get in close where they could shoot us. So the sister ship went out and depth charged it and sunk it. They didn't find out for a few days until Seawolf just didn't report anymore. They said, oops. Wow, how many lives lost? It should have been, I don't know, 60 or 40 or something so, like that. Full complement? It, yes. If you look on there, there'll be a plaque. I think Seawolf is up towards the, at the north. It'll say when it went down and most likely how many lives were lost. Wow. Never heard that so, story. So, uh, yeah. Well, you're, you're welcome. Oh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. I didn't get a pick on some of you as much as I would have liked to. <laughs> but uh, <sighs> after a few days, you guys will all forgive me about my shortcomings. Oh, that was so, fantastic. Uh, Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that tour with Keith. Uh, what follows the next five minutes or so is uh, some additional footage that I grabbed after I uh, had the tour with Keith that you just uh, saw there of uh, some of the areas of the submarine that we didn't get time uh, to look around. So I'm going to walk all the way around the outside of the submarine um, and uh, also go back inside uh, in a little bit, admire some of the signs uh, like that one, and uh, uh, also go back inside the submarine, like I say, one more walk through from one end uh, to most of the other, uh, just capturing some of the... Uh, areas inside that I didn't uh, get enough time to uh, record whilst uh, we were listening to Keith's tour. So this is just sort of uh, uh, additional uh, pieces to fill out, make sure I captured uh, again in VR like the rest of it while I was there, uh, the full experience uh, of the Cavella uh, at the site here in, uh, in Galveston, Texas. Um, and uh, also um, I wanted to include the story uh, of the Cavella as well, sort of her, her history. Uh, so with that, let's have that. USS Cavella, June the 19th and 20th, 1944. On her maiden patrol, the USS Cavella SS-244 was ordered to relieve the submarine Flying Fish SS-229 on June 15, 1944 at the San Bernardino Strait. En route, Lieutenant Commander Herman J. Kostler received an abrupt change of orders. Imperial Japanese Navy Vice Admiral Jizaburu Ozawa's massive attack force had been spotted by the flying fish steaming towards the Marianas. Admiral Lockwood instructed the Kavala to lay in wait for the task force about 350 miles east of San Bernardino Strait. The enemies were planning a major attack and their strategy to offset the growing American superiority was cunning and practical. Enemy carrier planes from nine carriers would attack the American fleet and fly on to land bases to rearm and refuel. Meanwhile, enemy land-based aircraft from Guam, Tinian, and Saipan would strike from their surrounding positions and seek resupply on the carriers. This would produce a doubling of enemy attack power. Three hours after she reached her station, Cavella detected four ships by radar. Captain Kostler began a high-speed end-around to pass the ships and obtain a prime shooting position. After four hours of skirting the enemy ships, Cavella closed in with the convoy. Kostler dived the boat and began plotting a firing solution. The convoy consisted of two tankers escorted by destroyers. Before Kostler was ready to shoot, one of the escorts swung onto an attack course with the Cavella. Realizing he had been spotted, Kostler sought deep refuge. The destroyer lingered over the Cavella until the rest of the convoy could escape. Upon surfacing, 
Kostler was greeted by an empty sea. Kostler radioed Pearl Harbor that his intentions were to abandon the chase of the two tankers and wait for the warships. Admiral Lockwood deduced that the tankers were headed for a rendezvous with the capital ships to refuel them. He ordered Covella to resume tracking the tankers. Air activity was becoming an increasing problem for Covella. Enemy aircraft restricted Covella's progress, forcing her to dive numerous times. After a long and trying day, the Covella's radar screen came alive. On 19th of June, at 0800 hours, the lone submarine Covella had crossed the path of 15-plus battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. Captain Kostler now faced a dilemma. Standing orders required he report the battle's group size, speed, and course ahead of all other considerations. Kostler found himself in a favorable position for an approach to one of the cruisers, but he decided to stick to orders. While following the group and assessing their strength and makeup, Covella was detected by destroyers and driven down. The battle group released two destroyers to deal with Covella. It was night before Covella was able to surface and send off a report of the sighting. Although the crew was disappointed and the captain heartsick, their report was of the greatest strategic significance to the worried American fleet. Now, U.S. naval planners knew exactly where the enemy strength lay. The task force had gotten away, but Kostler wasn't willing to give up the chase. Though beginning to get low on fuel, Covella continued to follow the tankers. After hours of high-speed surface running, it became apparent that the trail had grown cold. Kostler turned Covella around and headed back for the San Bernardino Strait. Shortly after dawn, enemy air activity in Covella's vicinity had increased to a fever pitch. Crossler radioed headquarters and reported the position. Shortly before noon on June the 19th, while surveying the swarming planes from periscope depth, Covella's sound man reported heavy screws approaching. Rushing to meet the planes was a battle group of one carrier, two cruisers, and a destroyer. It was the enemy aircraft carrier Shokaku, one of six carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor. Kostler and his crew plotted a 90-degree attack approach on their first target. Shokaku was at the center of countless aircraft circling and landing. Covella closed the range to 1,200 yards. At 11, 1,800 hours, Kostler fired all six of his bow torpedoes. As the torpedoes streaked towards the carrier, a nearby destroyer spotted the wakes and wheeled to attack. Covella dove deep to evade retribution. Three of her, of her torpedoes found their mark. The Chicago rocked with the explosions of her munitions and fuel reserves. In four hours, the Chicago sank. Covella had taken out one of the largest vessels in the world. A hero's escape ensued after Covella's success. Enemy destroyers drove Covella under her designed 300 feet of seawater maximum depth. The Covella maneuvered away from a massive attack from two enemy destroyers in pursuit of Covella. The sound gear was knocked out of commission and the whole ventilation system was damaged. Costa managed to elude enemy destroyers and three hours later, after 105 depth charges were dropped on his boat, Kostler radioed Pearl Harbor. Hit Chicago class carrier with three out of six torpedoes. Dot dot dot. Received 105 depth charges during three hour period. Dot dot dot. Heard four terrific explosions in the direction of target two and one half hours after attack. Dot dot dot. Believe that baby sank. Hours prior to Gavella's sinking of the Chicago, the submarine USS Albacore SS-218 alone, concentrated air power by the US Navy's Hellcat pilots, sank enemy carrier Tayo. The Covella dealt the crippling blow, causing the Imperial Navy to abandon their defense of the Marianas Islands and retreat. The Covella's sinking of Chicago changed the course of World War II in the Pacific Ocean. 
All right, I hope you enjoyed that uh, additional that uh, history uh, of the Cavella. Uh, this is the flag that uh, Keith was mentioning, uh, made by original by the lady in the picture there, and uh, the the duplicate uh, made again. Uh, back outside, looking at the front torpedoes. Uh, excuse me, the the rear. This is the the back uh, of the vessel uh, right here, with some torpedoes out of it, just capturing uh, the full the full view. So this is looking towards the uh, the bow of the ship uh, from the rear, just capturing that scene uh, as well. And then another look at uh, some of those missiles that. Uh, we were, um, that Keith was showing us at the beginning of the tour, but uh, one thing we didn't get a look at were the uh, torpedoes loaded in the tubes uh, here, again uh, in the stern of the vessel. So I thought I'd see if I could tuck the camera behind, uh, behind the hull there and have a little look. And so this is what the, the camera caught. See some of the uh, internals, the outside of the torpedo tubes uh, right there, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting. So that's why I captured that. Camera can go where I could not, of course. So again, looking towards the bow there. And uh, finally, uh, some views of uh, just right next to, to Seawolf Park. So this is right next to where the Cavella is uh, sort of sat uh, right ahead. You can see, see her ahead there, uh, sat in the ground, uh, in fact. She's uh, set in, in, the, in the soil. Um, and this is uh, a nice fishing pier in the, uh, the Sea Wolf Park um, area of, uh, of Galveston. A lot of folks fishing on this, on this beautiful day. There's a children's play area. It's uh, quite a large area. Uh, way out uh, on the edge of the island here, a nice place to uh, come and uh, and relax. Uh, as a parking area, like I hold children's play area at one end, and you can watch all of the ships. There's ferries going backwards and forwards, and uh, you might have seen them. We watched uh, a cruise ship come past uh, from Carnival, uh, came in from the sea here to dock at the Galveston Bay. So a nice place to, to hang out. And uh, for this video, a nice place to finish up. So thanks very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe.